Hello and welcome to Sustainable Finance Week. We'll be bringing together global policymakers, opinion formers, and professionals from across private wealth and sustainable finance to discuss private capital financing sustainability. Congratulations for developing what is now a world-class international event. Business has to change, society has to change, we have to be much more intentional and quicker at addressing environmental and social challenges. I think that is one of the real success stories of Guernsey is that we are already doing that. There's always going to be sort of little things that are different here and there. In fact, there's a lot of like-minded people here who have a common goal. At the cutting edge of impacting the, the climate in the most positive way the challenges the insurance industry are facing. You think about the amounts of data that an insurer has. What we know about future climate change and how that relates to the insurance industry. What net zero actually means and what it looks like in investment portfolios. You are by accident of fate alive in an absolutely critical moment in the history of our planet. And I think it's so true. I would argue there really isn't any other agenda than this. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rupert Pleasant, and I'm the CEO of Guernsey Finance. Guernsey Finance itself is a joint initiative between the states of Guernsey and the Guernsey financial services industry to connect and promote Guernsey as an international finance centre into its chosen target markets. And it gives me great pleasure to open the second core day of Guernsey Sustainable Finance Week 2022 in association with our media partner, The Financial Times. Welcome to those of you who are joining for the first time this week, and welcome back to anybody who was with us yesterday. We're in full swing of the event now, and it's really been fantastic to hold this week fully live and in person after having to adapt over the last couple of years due to COVID. Webinars have been extremely useful to keep things ticking over, but there's nothing quite like face-to-face -face interaction and networking. Before I go on, I'd like you to turn your attention, if you will, to the screen for a very special video to drive home the message of why we're here today. Hello, my name's Rachel Scott and I'm a producer and director at the BBC's Natural History Unit in Bristol. I work alongside Sir David Attenborough on series such as Blue Planet 2 and Frozen Planet 2, which is on air at the moment. I'm also very proud to say that I'm a Guernsey girl and so I'd like to welcome you all to our beautiful island as part of Guernsey's Sustainable Finance Week 2022 and I'm just sorry that I can't be there in person to meet you all. For the series I was able to travel all over the world to help film and I think the thing that I found most amazing and surprising about working on this series was the variety and diversity of life found in the frozen parts of our planet. Not just in the Arctic and the Antarctic, but in frozen peaks, under the ice in frozen lakes, frozen tundra, deserts and grasslands and the taiga forest. It's been a really amazing series to have been a part of and the reason that we felt that it was time to make the follow-up to the original more than 10 years ago is because technology has improved so much in that time we we're able to tell stories that we simply wouldn't have been able to tell just a decade ago but also these cold parts of our world are changing rapidly because of climate change and so we wanted to document that change we of course film predominantly natural history but we also wanted to film the change that was occurring on our watch. And so we filmed the melt from microscope level right up to commandeering satellites to take daily photographs of the Arctic sea ice retreating and the ice on top of the Alps reducing. In the last 40 years alone, half of the Arctic summer sea ice has disappeared and it's predicted that by 2035 it will disappear completely. Just around the corner from us in the Alps, they think that the Alps will be ice-free by the turn of the century. Of course, this has a fundamental impact on the life of the animals that live there, but it will also have a huge impact on us. 
we're all responsible for that and we can all make a difference but you in that room today can make a much bigger difference than most your world leaders and sustainable advocates and the conversations and discussions that you might be having this week could really change the planet so thank you for being here and i'd like to share with you a short clip from my episode frozen ocean Well, I think that's a very powerful way to start the day, um, really to see firsthand that kind of footage of the real damaging effects of climate change. Our thanks very much go to Rachel for her message and the use of that clip. As she said, all of us in the room can make an enormous difference as sustainable advocates and thought leaders, and the conversations that we have this week really can change the planet. For those of you who were here yesterday, please bear with me for a moment. Uh, but a bit of background on Guernsey's involvement in sustainable finance for those of us who are joining us here today. Guernsey is a world leader and a force for global good through its strategic commitment to sustainable finance. The island's dedicated green and sustainable finance initiative, Guernsey Green Finance, has been a member of the United Nations Financial Centres for Sustainability since 2018, while the Guernsey Financial Services Commission is a member of the Network for Greening the Financial System. Guernsey's leading the way with the launch in 2018 of the world's first regulated green fund regime, the Guernsey Green Fund, to provide the certainty of a trusted and transparent product to inspire investor confidence. I'm also delighted to announce, for those of you who were not already aware, of yesterday's official launch of Guernsey's natural capital fund regime by the Guernsey regulator providing further evidence that the island has been at the forefront of solving the, cri uh, the climate crisis for some time and being another world first, we hope. Our new report that was launched yesterday, Private Finance and its role in supporting the transition to net zero, which will be discussed later today, also identifies the vital role that financial services industry can play in achieving a just transition to a net zero future. You'll find a few hard copies dotted around on the tables, but will provide details of how to find this digitally a little later on. So yesterday was all about biodiversity. Continuing our journey through the three key themes of the 2022 Guernsey Green Finance Strategy, today we turn our attention to the energy transition. So what do we mean by the energy transition and how does it affect the financial services sector? We hope to answer the questions across today's jam-packed schedule of speeches and panel sessions. We'll focus on the insurance and investment industries as they seek to support and engage with the risks and opportunities the energy transition presents, while also exploring portfolio assessments and investment options for the future, how we track the transition and whether it's on schedule to deliver a 1.5 degree world, and the trends in reporting and KPIs that deliver decision useful data to investors. Obviously, we're holding this event in the shadow of extremely sad news for the United Kingdom and for the rest of the world, following the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the 8th of September. Part of her vast legacy will be her love for the environment and preserving it for future generations. She herself gave a speech at COP26 last year, and her son, our new king, His, Maj His Majesty Charles III, sent his best wishes to Guernsey for a successful Sustainable Finance Week last year, and His Majesty's Sustainable Markets Initiative video was played to open the event. We're proud to be playing our part in an issue that meant so much to Her Majesty and also to her family. We'll be covering the event live on our social media channels via our dedicated Sustainable Finance Twitter page at Guernsey Green Finance. Feel free to engage with us there using the hashtag WeAreSustainable to join the conversation. There'll also be an opportunity to meet other delegates over drinks afterwards and discuss the key takeaways of the day. Today's headline sponsor is HSBC, and we're delighted to have a carbon offset sponsor package for the first time, sponsored by the International Stock Exchange based here in Guernsey. Sustainability is built into all aspects of the conference, but this sponsorship enables us to ensure the event will be truly carbon neutral. For its international beneficiary, TIES has selected a high quality international verified offset. The project is the Bauminvest Mixed Reforestation in Costa Rica, which aims to reforest pasture land 
previously used for extensive cattle ranching in northern Costa Rica, using mixed strands of various indigenous tree species, which includes teak. Locally, Ties will donate to the Guernsey Conservation Volunteers, who work to conserve Guernsey's natural environment, working on picturesque sites and nature reserves around the island to maintain and enhance the biodiversity of the area. So, let's get started on this afternoon. My colleague, Stephanie Glover, Guernsey Finance's Head of Strategy and Sustainable Finance, will be linking the sessions throughout the afternoon. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker for today, Adam Matthews, who is Chief Responsible Investment Officer at the Church of England's Pensions Board. Matthew is also the chair of the $45 trillion in assets under the management-backed Transition Pathway Initiative and a board member of the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change. Adam co-leads sector engagement on some of the hardest industries to transition, mining and steel sectors, with the Global Investor Engagement Initiative, Climate Action 100 Plus. He chairs Mining 2030, which is developing an investor agenda to address systemic challenges to mining and the low carbon transition. Adam truly is the leading voice on the energy transition and driving the change necessary, and we're honored to have him joining us here in Guernsey today. Please join me in giving Adam a warm Guernsey, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that um, introduction, Rupert, which was uh, very fulsome, so I apologise for that. <laughs> but um, really wonderful to be here and to see the progress that's been made and to also look through the report on the table, which is yeah, I'm going to take away and really engage with. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak to you and um, hopefully there's some time to really get into some of the themes that um, I'll raise during my presentation and I'm very conscious I've got an expert panel that follows this that to be honest actually know more than I do. So um, hopefully I'm not going to be too much of a distraction to some of the sort of detail that I'm sure that they'll be able to get into. But um, when talking to colleagues here, um, Josephine, Stephanie and, and, and Rupert, in terms of what they were after, was a, a sort of framing of some of the issues on the energy transition. And um, a, a lot of the work I do is, is very much connected to that. So I'm just going to talk through sort of four themes that are uh, top of my mind at the moment, um, where we as a pension fund are very intimately involved and equally working with many other actors across the, the finance industry. Um, you may ask, what is a Chief Responsible Investment Officer? Um, there's four of us in existence uh, around the world, um, one at uh, Mundi, one at Brunel Pension Fund and Aviva and myself. And my job is I sit alongside the Chief Investment Officer. The two of us are co-directors of the uh, finance function of our pensions board. Maybe one day they'll be embodied in one person, but at the moment they're two separate roles. And it's very much an attempt by the fund to embed responsible investment in everything we do and in all decisions that we do on behalf of the beneficiaries who we serve. Um, and as a pension fund, we're a £4 billion pension fund. We're open, serve so 42,000 um, beneficiaries that will require a pension fund. And our job really is to provide that pension fund into the coming decades. Um, we are an open fund. We are growing. Our assets will grow. And one of the most significant challenges to us as a fund is to navigate the low carbon transition. And what does that mean for the way that we invest, for the way that um, we grasp opportunities, and equally, ultimately, how do we ensure that we um, can pay those pensions that um, our beneficiaries will require, but without damaging the world into which they will retire into? And we hold those two things very much together. And in, and in doing that, we have a commitment to be net zero, an easy thing to make for 2050. Uh, many people have done it and now come in under the, the legitimate scrutiny of how serious are those commitments. What does that mean in the short, medium, long term? But as a fund, we are all in. We are absolutely committed to being net zero, as are many other pension funds we work with. And to do that, it really means that you have to engage across all of your asset classes, really understand what the transition means in areas that, quite frankly, there, aren't, there isn't clarity at the moment, and to really work constructively, openly with others to create the frameworks where they don't exist and the interventions to drive the change that needs to occur. 
we have a material interest in the transition occurring. It's in our beneficiaries' interests, it's in society's interests. And as a fund, the way that we approach the engagement, um, our investments, that's very much part of the thinking that's embedded in it. And so by being net zero committed, we've worked to create a, a framework and um, the Paris Land Investment Framework, it's there, it's available, you can look at it. Um, and that's an evolving, living way to guide pension funds in the transition. So I just wanted to sort of start here because it really is the sort of the clarity that we're in. We're clear about where we, we, we are in terms of the energy transition and what we think needs to happen. And therefore, um, what's, yeah, and the kind of challenges we're going to have to navigate. And just in terms of where we are related to our listed equity, so you've got this context, um, we're sort of the, the, the line there um, at the moment in terms of the way that we've adjusted our portfolio. Um, and that's come as a result of some of the work that I'll, I'll be coming on to. But we remain invested in every high carbon intensive sector. We remain invested in the oil and gas sector, steel, um, aluminium, etc. So we've not extracted ourselves from all of the sectors. We've intentionally differentiated. And again, I'll come into some of the ways that we're trying to do this. So the transition. Well, you've asked me here to speak. <clears throat> Um, you may have seen this cartoon. It's probably the, the sort of the residual cartoon that you flip up when you have a difficult decision to make to justify the complexity of your answer. But um, nonetheless, I still think it is absolutely pertinent to the challenge of the transition. No one has done this before. It is a multi-decadal transition about re-engineering the whole global economy, primarily initially led by environment ministers who control very little, uh, now increasingly very much an agenda of finance ministries and government leaders. Um, and it's difficult. It is deeply challenging. It's going to be messy, and it is happening. So the transition is underway, and there are many people that present easy answers to the transition. Maybe some of those will be ones that work in the context of the many others that will be difficult and challenging and complex but required. And really, engaging with that complexity is unavoidable, and that's one of the things that we feel is essential to really sort of underpin the way that we try and sort of understand what we need to do. But in terms of the transition happening, um, just using a couple of slides here from the Transition Pathway Initiative, um, probably far too small for a screen like this, so deeply unhelpful of me. But nonetheless, look at the green versus the red. Um, and really, TPI, if you're not familiar with it, is a tool that is, is free to use. It's the London School of Economics Grantham Research Institute. Um, it's used by investors with 50 trillion in assets under management now. Um, and we as a fund actively embed it into indices we've created with FTSE. Um, and it takes this data and brings it to life and guides our engagement, guides our understanding of the transition in key sectors. But my point about the transition happening, when we started TPI five years ago, when we wanted to set up an independent way of assessing which companies are well equipped on management, doing all the sensible things you would expect of a company board, and is that translating through to genuine commitments and targets and action, which is represented by these, these sort of amalgamated bars of underlying assessments of individual companies. And so TPI provides that um, scrutiny, and, and these, these are the airline shipping auto sector. But as I said, when we started, many of the companies were not even disclosing. Now, the vast majority of companies are disclosing, so the grey bars of non-disclosing companies that still resist actually acknowledging climate change exists have shrunk considerably. And equally, you are now seeing genuinely aligned targets emerging across all sectors that TPI assesses to the most ambitious goals of the low-carbon transition. Um, in the short, medium and long term. It's easier to make the long term one, as I said at the beginning, because clearly that's a long term um, uh, imperative over multiple decades. But the credibility of that target is based on what you do in the short and medium term, which TPI also tracks and we need to understand. And here again, in um, four other sectors, steel, cement, paper, aluminium, you've still got a bit more recalcitrant um, companies that are fundamentally challenged by this issue of climate change to their business model, and yet they still don't disclose to their shareholders, their owners, basic information that we can measure. Do they actually have a plan, a strategy, and targets that are aligned to the transition? But again, in each of these sectors which are challenging for the transition, you are seeing credibly aligned targets emerge. So anyone that says the transition is happening 
is wrong. It is happening. The question is, is the pace sufficient? Is it happening in line with the science of the climate, um, Paris Climate Agreement? And that's where the challenge is. We need to see this pick up pace. But the difference over a relatively short pace period of time has been quite significant, um, and TPI captures that. But we're challenged. And quite clearly, we're all aware that the world changed very significantly, particularly in Europe, um, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine and the impact that that has had on the transition. So post up to Glasgow, you had the Glasgow COP, which was actually successful in many respects, um, and yet still left a lot of unfinished business and still a lot of um, steps to be taken, but nonetheless quite successful, particularly in mobilising the finance sector. And now you've had this challenge, which has caused a rush for securing energy over any other priority. Quite understandably, governments need to secure energy. Um, there's a need to ensure homes are heated and that there's an ability to be able to support the population in that. But the challenge here is, does that disrupt the energy transition? And in some instances, you've seen some moves by some governments, not too far away from here, suggesting that this justifies reopening or even going further in opening oil fields, gas fields, etc., to um, reduce demand for Russian oil and gas and help the transition away from Russia. Equally, you've seen a real significant interest in recognising, well, actually, renewables gives you an independence that is actually very attractive from an energy security perspective and a cost perspective, and I'm sure some of the panellists who are better equipped in the detail of that will be able to go into that. But this is now a more challenging landscape in which to navigate the transition. And so what are the implications for us as investors in, in this space? And here I've tried to sort of frame a response in the sort of first part of this issue. So really, I, I think particularly when you're looking at governments, and obviously many investors are holders of sovereign debt, we don't really engage with governments in the same way that we engage with our underlying um, corporate holdings, but nonetheless, tools are now emerging through TPI to look at the way governments are uh, addressing climate change, the rigour of their targets, and I think that transparency will flow through to how governments are translating their own commitments into the licensing of oil and gas exploration. And I think equally, you're going to see a lot more legal challenge um, of government decisions in this space, and there are legitimate questions in terms of what it is that you're going to be locking in versus other alternatives that may be cheaper, may be quicker, and may actually equally not lock you into a carbon path, and at the same time undermine your legal commitments to um, net zero. So in terms of sort of looking at some of the issues, considerations around where we look at governments, these are some of the things that we're, we're looking at and the framing that we are um, st starting to use. But for companies, which obviously we're directly invested in, I think it's an even more difficult challenge because, yes, they are there operating in jurisdictions where countries will determine what is exploited and what isn't. But they also have to justify to their shareholders that they are not only committed to net zero, increasingly in response to their shareholder expectations, but at the same time that they can demonstrate that their capital expenditure is aligned to those targets and that there's transparency to run alongside that. And equally, you would ask, well, actually, what's the regulatory certainty that what you may be starting to plough into actually has the long longevity of the kind of investment that you would need for it to be a genuinely worthwhile investment, as well as the growing litigation risk? With pension fund... <clears throat> along with many companies, I think are in a very new world where you will see routine legal action against you. And you need to be absolutely conscious of that when you are making these decisions, because they will come under that level of scrutiny. But at the same time, there is that societal imperative still, which, isn't, um, which still needs to be addressed, of achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and there, I think it's the company's license and boards need to weigh that, how they can actually ensure that they are retaining the confidence of society in the actions that they may think in the short term serve an imperative, but in the medium to long term could be ones that could be deeply regrettable. So whilst I'm not prescribing any particular way for a company to respond or a government to respond here, I'm trying to frame the kind of decisions that I think the wider investor community working in the transition space are looking in relation to to Russia. And my sense is that there's an opportunity here to go faster on particular low carbon transition um, in interventions. 
But one of the other areas that we really do need to focus in is energy demand. And I've led the um, engagement with Royal Dutch Shell for about three years. Um, I recently rotated to start working with auto companies, very much because of the experience we had with Shell. And Climate Action 100, if you're not familiar, is the 60 trillion global investor engagement initiative. That is the investor stewardship effort to help the major emitting companies across 16 sectors transition, publicly listed ones. And there, I think many of the standards are being set on the transition in each of the sectors. And with Shell, in the engagement we led there, we had a company that acknowledged Scope 3 emissions, a company that started to set targets related to not just their own direct emissions, but also Scope 3 ones. Um, they linked executive remuneration to achieving those targets. They came out with a transition plan. They put it to an AGM vote. So they took a number of steps. Now, they're rightly still under a lot of scrutiny as to whether it's sufficiently rigorous and the targets are sufficiently ambitious. But one of the key things was so much of Shell's ability to transition is dependent on the demand side. And while Shell can work with their customers, ultimately, if they turn off the taps to the airline industry, the percentage that they provide, be it sort of, I think it's about 8 10%, someone else simply replaces that, and most likely not necessarily a listed company. And so how do you work with the demand side to reshape that demand, which ultimately is going to determine a Shell transitions and will also determine whether we can retain an investment in Shell in line with our net zero commitment. And there there needs to be a much greater focus on working through each of the demand sectors than, than we currently have as investors. Alongside that, the policy and regulatory landscape for each of those sectors as well as the macro is absolutely essential. And again, a company like Shell is a significant influencer of that regulatory landscape but at the same time, they don't determine it. And we need to ensure that they are lobbying through their industry associations, through their own investments in, in lobbying, in line with their own net zero commitments. But there's a legitimate point that Shell has made around how we can look, work with the demand side. And here, I think you're going to see over the next um, few months, in particular with the Global Engagement Initiative, a much greater focus on demand. We've had a huge intensive focus on the oil and gas sector, on the electricity industry. Um, we've put shareholder resolutions, we've used our votes, etc. We've even started replacing directors in company boards. Um, but we have not had the same intensity through the rest of the demand side. And as I say, reshape demand, you reshape supply. And so my second area really is this, this need to focus on demand. But I don't think that removes the responsibility of an oil and gas company, nonetheless, to still have rigorous, ambitious targets related to all of their emissions. So yes, Shell has 80% of its emissions from its customers who use the products that they sell. They should still be setting targets that are connected to achieving net zero alignment of those and be incentivizing themselves to work with their customers but listing the dependencies and working with investors, working with the value chains to help deliver on those targets. We've also got to sophisticate the investor tools. And here, tools like TPI at the moment are very good at looking at an individual company, but looking through that company to how it relates with key sectors, particularly the large ones, I think is a way that we could evolve our understanding of that relationship between a company and the shipping sector or the aviation sector, and equally working through our shareholdings in those companies to ensure that they're moving on a more ambitious path aligned to the transition and creating that change in demand that enables companies like Shell to also move. Um, and then lastly, I, I underline that policy point as well, um, again, that we, we, if you are committed to net zero, it's not just about your targets, it's about how you influence in line with net zero and ensuring that there is that net zero aligned policy. So that's sort of my second point really is that you, we need to, as investors, focus throughout that value chain. It's not just a debate about oil and gas transition or electricity transition, absolutely essential as it is, but we've got to get as much more focus in through that value chain. The third area I was going to pick up on is emerging markets, and, and here I think um, trust is the key thing. Um, and if you haven't watched um, Prime Minister Mia Motley's speech at the opening of COP26, where in the opening plenary she got up and basically told the world off, um, or in effect told the G7 off. 
And she did it with such eloquence and grace that it, it is just worth going online, spending the, I can't remember exactly how long it is, about five minutes, but it's, it's, it's brilliant, oh no, eight minutes, 20 seconds. Um, the clue's on the screen. Um, but it's brilliant because it really showed the challenge that emerging markets, the rest of the world that also needs to transition, has with the failure of the developed world to fulfill its promises. There's a trust deficit and their right to development but their right to a development that isn't constrained by imposing targets upon them that will constrain their ability to provide energy to their people and to have the developed economies that they're seeking. And when you sort of break this down, and these are some graphs I've nicked from BlackRock, um, which I haven't accredited properly on there, but I am now verbally doing that. Um, but you, you see the gap. Um, funding is in the purple pink dot on, on the far side. The yellow sort of tranche along the middle bit is basically where it needs to be, and the red dot is where the International Energy Agency um, is saying that funding needs to be annual investment in spending to emerging economies to support the transition. It's nowhere near where it needs to be. We don't do this. We don't support that transition in emerging economies. The costs to us are far greater. The cost will be in adaptation requirements, in the need to support far greater interventions in these economies, but equally, the fact that we will not have achieved one and a half degrees or there or thereabouts um, will just not be possible. And the costs, in turn, will be much more significant to us. So it is absolutely in our financial, let alone our moral, interest to be working on this area. And at the moment, there has been insufficient focus in the investment community on this. Um, and when you put this uh, context of how quickly, as a community in the developed world, we we're able to mobilise this level of funding, rightly so, when we hit crisis through the pandemic, but the funding, the little tiny dot on the end that is current and the slightly bigger one, the needed, to where we were able to mobilise in very small order, and we've been doing this years and years and years of discussions in the international process, you see the challenge. And I think finance and private finance in particular has got a really important role to proactively, practically work with emerging markets to find ways to unlock this because there's enormous opportunity in these markets. And as a pension fund, we are very interested in playing our role in that market. And unfortunately, it's missing part of the slide here, but on the left, there's a um, statement from the pension funds that um, have joined together with us to find a way. There's 12 of us representing about 500 billion pounds, 17 million members in, in the UK. We want to invest in emerging markets. We already do so, but we want to invest directly in support of the transition in emerging markets. And so we've, we've established an initiative to do that UK government at the moment has been very helpful with that, although the pension minister stepped down yesterday. Um, but nonetheless, he was very supportive. Um, and again, the kind of thinking that we're evolving in this, and in, in terms of the third area that I wanted to cover, really was just a way that we can sort of reflect that urgency, both moral and financial. It is in our members' interests as a pension fund to be looking at ways to support the transition in emerging markets. Um, it's very important, though, that it isn't an imposition of an external perspective of this is what you need to do. This is about enabling countries to transition in line with their own nationally determined commitments. That was the beauty of the Paris Agreement, the intelligence of Christiana Figueres, where she inverted the UN process. She turned it upside down and she made it based on what governments do themselves. They bring their commitments. We then collect them all together, add them up and work out if it's enough, and then you codify the way forward together. And this is where the funding needs to roll in behind governments that are genuinely making commitments that are sufficiently ambitious. And if you look at countries like South Africa, it's about one and a half to 1.8 degree nationally determined commitment that they made ahead of COP, but it needs significant international finance to come in. And part of that is going to be public finance. And so the G7 has put 7 billion on the table, which is great. It's not enough, but it's nonetheless, it's helpful. But where is it that pension funds, where is it banks, where is it the rest of the sort of finance industry can start to come in behind that public money to enable South Africa to deliver on its commitment? And there it's a complex transition. And that's where I go to this point about owning the real, real world emissions and recognition. It's the 
complex picture. In a country like South Africa, it's about recognizing 120,000 people are involved in producing coal, but directly involved in mining coal, let alone the ancillary businesses to that. It's a coal-based energy system that's deeply inefficient. And to transition South Africa and deliver their strategy requires us to recognize that there's a period in which there's going to still remain coal-based. There's a period in which you're going to have to build up that energy grid capacity. You're going to have to develop that renewables alternative. You're going to have gas as some kind of transitionary function. And in that, you're going to also need to justly transition that workforce and those communities that are absolutely dependent on those coal mines. And in that kind of whole picture, I think you've got solutions that will enable countries to go further as in, in the international political process if they know that people are practically coming to them with solutions. And we as a pension fund, if we can meet our risk return requirements, find vehicles that are able to do that, then I think that's an absolutely legitimate way for us to look at the ways, that the role that we can have alongside other pension funds in unlocking the transition in emerging markets. But there's a transition Achilles heel. Um, I'm terrible on timing, so if you want to wave at me and tell me to shut up, please, please do. I've probably gone over my allocation here. Um, but there's an Achilles heel, um, and this is one that I have been working on for a number of years alongside the work with the oil and gas sector and others. It, it's the role of minerals, and you're increasingly seeing a recognition of this. The country that's got this is China, absolutely has cornered the understanding decades and decades ago of the importance of all of these minerals in the low carbon transition and in terms of sourcing and in terms of producing and sort of um, the steps you need to take once you've actually got it out the ground, China have absolutely nailed it. Um, and there is now a recognition, and I'm now engaging with the auto company. I don't believe any auto company can tell me honestly that they know their supply chain beyond the next three years. They have not got the minerals for the battery demand that they're going to have to meet. And so you've got all these commitments to electrification. You've got all these commitments to wind farms um, that are absolutely dependent on these minerals in different contexts. And if you're going to meet the demand that's projected here, um, recognising there'll be some substitution, there'll be some evolution in how we do this, but nonetheless, there's going to be massive demand for all of this. Um, I, I just don't believe a company that tells me they're sourced into the coming decade, quite frankly. And you see the mismatch here between production um, just of these three copper, lithium, cobalt, and the primary demand to just meet one of the UN scenarios, the SDS one. And so there's a problem here. Um, I think you're seeing political commitments to a transition that's going to be undermined by our ability to effectively mine. And part of the problem with mining, and here this brilliant thing I've nicked off LinkedIn, I can't remember who it is and I can't credit them, but it's brilliant. Um, this mine, um, someone visualised, an artist did it, um, the lump of copper that came from this mine. All grades are declining and mining has not really evolved significantly. Um, it still involves a huge amount of removing everything else to get what it needs to get out the ground. And this lump of copper from this mine and all that waste um, has to then be stored somewhere, the great externality of mining. Um, and at one level, this image was sort of put there as a sort of negative thing. Gosh, look at where's all this waste gone to get just that lump of copper. But at the same time, that lump of copper does this um, if used purely just for that purpose. Um, and it's hugely important. It's absolutely imperative to the low carbon transition. And therefore, we've got a challenge because what, the waste which is stored in dams, which have been unregulated um, in many jurisdictions, but have basically been dealt with as cheaply as possible, are collapsing. And the most recent one collapsed a week ago in South Africa, which is a legacy dam. Um, it's a tailings facility. It killed um, two people, but m knocked out a whole town. Very visual thing. And you've had a series of dams collapsing. Now, the point I'm raising here is this is one issue. It's an issue that impacts the mining sector that they're, deal they're having to deal with. And I'm just, I'm horribly timing. If we can just play this video briefly, just to give you the context of a tailing dam and a disaster that happened um, three years ago. We won't play it all. Um, but that green wall is the dam.
So if you want to stop the video, um, that, that's great. I mean, this, um, this led to the deaths of 270 people, um, and the, the, the workers' cafe was around the corner from where the dam collapsed, and if you watch the video online, you see people in front of the dam. It's absolutely horrific. It should never have happened, and it's because we have been treating waste from the mining industry as an externality, and this is now the ultimate example of an externality that has become an absolute reality for an industry that is now grappling with a fix for it, and that solution for it has been driven by investors um, and we convened a group of other asset owners primarily and said this cannot happen we've had these other disasters we've engaged with the companies individually but we've now got to ensure that this never happens again across the industry we can't keep having these disasters you're killing the industry you're killing people you're destroying the, the environment you're destroying communities and so working with the others, we've been able to work with industry, with the UN, to create a global industry standard. That standard is now in operation, and you have companies that are committing to use this and implement the standard. It's a bloody difficult standard. It can evolve and still improve as a standard, but nonetheless, it's a global standard of best practice that now exists where it didn't. We've now got um, basically 54 companies, 46% by market cap, committed to using it. Um, we've got a further 64 that are reviewing it. We're voting against the chairs of companies that don't commit to use the standard, and that's been followed up and taken up by a number of other funds as well. But you've got a movement starting to happen in the industry that's been driven with investors working practically with companies and with the UN to create a standard where one didn't exist. But as I said, it's one example, one issue, where we've, got, we've rolled up sleeves, we've got involved, and we've got to sort of path through. But another issue, Rio Tinto blowing up a 46,000-year-old um, heritage site in Australia that led to both the CEO, the chair of the board, and various other executives losing their jobs in a financially successful company. Absolutely um, a disastrous event, huge loss of trust in the company, and the, again, another issue that has challenged the mining sector and the ability of people to want to remain invested in it. And so working with investors, we're now looking at how we can really reshape the mining sector so that it's one that can play the role it needs to in the transition, which means it's got to address not just tailings, not just not blowing up things that are of cultural value, but actually looking at a range of issues where there needs to be a much clearer systemic approach across the industry. There's really good practice in mining and really good practice. I've visited mines, I've seen it, and it's been some extremely good practice. But when something happens in the industry, it undermines the whole industry. And if you go back to that earlier need of what this industry needs to play, the role it needs to play in the low-carbon transition, and you have repeated incidents like this undermining its ability at the moment, we've got a real problem um, in the energy transition. And from an investor perspective, this is the kind of risk that we need to really engage with. And hence, we're devising a vision um, for the sector that will look at identifying standards across this raft of issues, where they exist or where they don't exist and need to be created in the way that we've done in tailings, how we can consolidate the proliferation of ESG disclosure requirements, how we can sort of build out an independent verification that when a company says it's doing something at head office, it's happening at the mine site, and ensuring that there's an alignment across that wider finance sector. It's not just investors, it's the banks, it's the insurers, which again we're doing on the issue of tailings. And then equally working with all companies that are very dependent on the minerals from this sector to be able to transition. So if you're interested in the kind of approach that we take, there's more detail in our propaganda um, on the stewardship report. Um, sorry, in, in our very important formal financial reporting council communication of 56 pages um, that you can access. But I hope I'm just giving you a sense of the, the way that we as a pension fund are approaching the transition. We are very outward facing. We recognize that as a fund, we will not get the changes that need to occur in our members' interests by doing it simply by ourselves or walking away from particular sectors. We know it's about building collaborations, it's about building standards, it's about having transparency and having institutions that can really drive the kind of change that needs to happen and putting your investments in line with your beliefs and principles in support of that if you can build those structures around it. So we have an outward facing approach. It's about those collaborations with other investors and everything we do is collaboratively um, collaborative. So thank you very much. I'm really apologetic it to everyone that I've run on time with and um, I appreciate the um, chance. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Adam, for that thought-provoking opening. And I'm sure we can all agree absolutely worth running five minutes over for. With the current energy crisis already affecting all of us, it's so important to remind ourselves that the solutions we need to take into consideration global targets to decarbonise our energy systems. But we must also understand the risks and costs of, of our failing to decarbonise. For those of you joining us for the first time today, my name is Stephanie Glover. I am Guernsey Finance's Head of Strategy and Sustainable Finance. Thank you for joining us for our second core day of Sustainable Finance Week, during which we'll be exploring the challenges and opportunities of the energy transition. Adam's speech was just the start of a busy schedule for today, so let's get straight into our next session. For our first panel session of the day, we'll be discussing what the energy transition really means for financial market participants. I'm pleased to welcome to the stage to join Adam, Peter Backman, Managing Director of Sustainable Infrastructure at Gresham House. Peter is fund manager for the Guernsey Domiciled British Sustainable Infrastructure Fund, whose investments support the shift from finite resources to clean energy and from traditional to sustainable infrastructure. We also have head of ESG for Next Energy Capital, Julia Gildy. Julia and Next Energy Capital is a leading investment and asset manager which focuses on solar PV. Julia also has over 20 years experience in the ESG sector. Next, we have HSBC Origination Director, Ross Keeling. Ross focuses on sustainable finance infrastructure transactions across Europe for HSBC. Finally, we invite Octopus Renewables Head of Energy Transition Investing, Harry Manesty. Harry is an investment director and leads the energy transition investment team at Octopus. He covers sectors including electric vehicles, hydrogen, grid, storage, and emissions capture. To moderate the discussion, I'm pleased to hand over to Guernsey Finance's Strategic Advisor for Sustainable Finance, Josephine Bush. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, Adam, thanks so much for the keynote. Um, it's really informative and insightful. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you to the panel for being here today. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to our Energy Transition Day. Um, I thought we'd kick off with a question to you, Ross, uh, if we may. Um, we've heard from Adam some very broad considerations as to the backdrop to the energy transition. Um, these are unprecedented times, um, adjusting to a post-COVID world, uh, the macroeconomic um, geopolitical environment at the moment with the Ukraine war, um, in inflation, commodity price, um, instability, etc. Um, how do we effectively navigate uh, through the energy transition? What can we practically do? Because it feels very complex. Sure. Um, a great question. Thanks, Josephine. I mean, I, I think the first thing to say is, you know, the, the, the climate transition is really an energy transition. Um, uh, just over 70% of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions are, come from fossil fuels, whether it's in creating electricity or, or, or transport or industry. So. Um, solving the energy uh, transition will go a very long way towards solving the, the climate transition. Um, I actually think that we, you know, if we get this right um, over the next, you know, decades and in front of us, um, there is a huge opportunity uh, to actually reduce cost in the overall economy um, and, and help solve some of those macro challenges that you've mentioned. So. Um, you know, I think everyone today will, will, will agree, and some people may be aware that like, the cheapest source of power today is, is, is clearly renewables. Um, so it makes cold economic sense for us to, to, to move into a, a low carbon energy system. Um, and recent research from, from Oxford University suggests that we could save $12 trillion by, by 2050 by doing so. So I think, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a difficult transition. It's not going to be a linear transition. Uh, we're going to have a lot of challenges along the way, um, mm -hmm. and some things will happen that will, will, will throw us off our course, like what's happening today in, 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 in energy markets in Europe and, and in Ukraine, et cetera. Um, but, but fundamentally, it makes economic sense and will ultimately reduce in a, in a, in a cheaper uh, marginal cost of power which feeds into everything, reduces inflation, uh, reduces um, energy insecurity, um, and, and is, fundamentally, is fundamentally going to create lots of opportunities in, in, the, in the medium term. So I think um, we have the technology to do it. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, you know, renewables, 
EVs, battery storage, um, green hydrogen, carbon capture, the technologies are here and, and the challenge now is really how do we scale that and how do we roll that out at pace and get through the bumps uh, uh, along the way. Um, so it feels like we can, we can see the end, we yeah. know where we need to get to, we know what the objective <coughs> is, but the hurdles that are in our way to get there uh, feel pretty high. Yeah. No, um, I, and the system response to enable us to jump over those hurdles um, needs to come together. So if you think about the political pillars, regulatory, yeah. the various stakeholders, corporate individuals, all of which sort of Adam's talked about uh, in his introductory speech. Where do we start? Is it, do we need a policy response that clearly signals how we move forward and not only on a national basis, but on a global basis, a coordinated global response? Yeah, I, 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 fundamentally, I think yes. And, and, and I think helpfully, you know, we've already seen some pretty material policy response in relation to what's happening today. Um, we've seen the Repower EU um, policy response in Europe, which is, which is a game changer for, for, for the energy industry in Europe. We've seen the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which is arguably the, the single biggest piece of climate legislation that's ever been made. So I, I think the, the, the big ship is turning in the right direction. Um, now I actually think the bigger challenge is, 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 is the, the sort of bureaucracy, the planning, the um, time it takes to connect to the grid, the, the actual grid investment itself. A, lo a, lot of, a lot of what needs to happen um, ha needs to happen at a kind of local and national level as well. So we need, mm -hmm. we need that global sort of uh, compass pushing us in the right direction but we also need national and local politics to get on board so we don't obstruct ourselves with, you know, I don't want a wind farm in my backyard and, um, uh, you know, various just kind of local politics that can often get in the way of the transition. But I, I, I think, I do think that the policy response we've seen to the energy crisis that's happening right now has been pretty swift and impressive. I think it's a challenge now of let's get on with it and implement it. But yet, I think only about 2.5% of post-COVID spend has been directed and aligned towards uh, the energy transition as yet. So mm. um, I think we understand the intent, but we're not seeing that translate into act action. So I don't mm. know if anyone else has got some observations on that. It'd be interesting to hear. Uh, from my perspective, I think we just can't keep investing in the same things and expect a different outcome. You know, I think that's fundamentally what we as an industry need to kind of get out there. And I think we also can't wait for the time for some of these new technologies to, to fully develop to the point where perhaps even a bank finance is ready. You know, we need to start to say, how do we do things differently that are commercially viable today? Mm -hmm. And that's really how we try to think about world, the world and that we try to work backwards from these big problems and try to find solutions today. And, I'll give you three examples where, where I think we're doing something today that really makes a difference. So one of them is around vertical farming, which we think can fundamentally change the way you grow our food. Mm -hmm. Second is around how we deal with the waste. And you talked about the cement and steel industries. We've got a, we've got a solution there that can really decarbonise that. And then biodiversity, we'll talk mm -hmm. about that and really the real impact there. But talking about vertical farming, we're building a vertical farm up in Norfolk, which is 25,000 square metres. We think it's the largest in the world when it's built. It sits on four acres. In that four acres, it can grow what it would take 1,000 to 2,000 acres to grow out in the field. So that's 250 to 500 times more efficient in terms of land. And land is one of the big limiting factors in terms of what we do. It uses 98, 99% less water than traditional field-grown crops, no chemicals and pesticides. Food security is massively improved. And given everything that's going on, that's a really big benefit. But then food miles are reduced. You know, we're growing it in the UK. We're 1,700 times better from a carbon perspective compared to imported field-grown crops. That's a huge benefit. And then the final thing, which I think is really cool, and we've probably all had those salad bags that go off after a couple of days. You know, we get 14 to 21-day shelf life extensions. And that's great because obviously it saves that salad bag, but it's great for the retailers because they can help their margin. But it comes down to waste and plastics. Now, plastics, I've read a stat recently. It's 
incredible. Every week, we ingest about five grams of plastic, microplastics through the foods and the seafood and all the things we eat. That's literally like taking a credit card and eating it every week. And that's what we're doing. And you know, what you can do with extension of shelf life, that really helps on plastic waste, which then has knock-on effects. The you know, plastic industry consumes about 115 coal-fired power plants worth of emissions. So you kind of need to start to take this more complex approach because this isn't a simple solution. This isn't a simple problem. You can't take linear pathways. The second one is, is around a business we've got called Waste Not, where we take end-of-life waste that would otherwise go to landfill and turn that into something that can directly replace coal in the cement and steel industries. Now, we've done a full carbon life cycle analysis of that, and that can generate about 800,000 tonnes of CO2 savings from one plant. That's about 500,000 cars off the road from that one action, and that is decarbonising the two hardest to abate industries, and you know, we need to think about that. And the final one that we're doing now is biodiversity, where there's some great research out there where some Oxford scientists have said, if we did nature-based solutions globally, we can create about 10 gigatons worth of CO2 savings a year. 10 gigatons, that's what the whole of the US, the whole of the EU, and Chaban combined produce in terms of emissions, and you can tackle that with nature. I mean, that is the simplest solution around, and that's something where you know, we're building these large habitat banks to capture that biodiversity and create that sort of impact. And the really cool thing long-term is that that biodiversity can actually have a cooling effect on the planet. You know, we've got a huge problem with going up in temperature. Nature-based solutions could potentially create half a degree plus of cooling effect. So there's some sort of practical examples of how I think we can do something today, and that's where the power of capital can really do what we need to do to affect change. And these are great examples of innovation. How do you balance that against impact and return, importantly, which will drive <laughs> where the capital flows? Yeah, look, we, we invest money on behalf of seven local authority pension funds. Yeah, I think about my customers being the people that have spent the last 30 years working at Greater Manchester, pension, uh, Greater Manchester Council. And we cannot in any way sacrifice financial returns. Like that would be in breach of their fiduciary duties allocating capital to us. So our duty is to go and look at things that are commercially viable, that you don't sacrifice for natural returns. And that's, I think, the biggest sea change I've seen. I've been doing this for 21 years. It's in the past, if you wanted to create impact, you had to sacrifice returns. Mm -hmm. And I think we're now at just a tipping point where actually the, it's the impact that drives returns. At the very least, it gives you a downside protection. At the upside, it gives you an asset that's a lot more valuable. And there's all this money that you know, Adam talked about earlier that is trying to come into this sort of sector. And you know, we know that that is therefore then going to make these assets more valuable. So we think long term, it's actually going to be an enhancing tool to assets to have the impact that we just talked about. And, and in following the opportunity, uh, Peter, um, particularly where you are being innovative, um, firstly, how do you spot that opportunity and how do you mitigate the risk that's associated with that? Spotting the opportunity is pretty simple. Like I think that video right at the start says to us that the environment is probably the biggest challenge. But um, you know, even down to the societal side, you, know, you talked about emerging markets. The biggest thing you can do in, to emerging markets in terms of their sustainability is actually give the woman in the family a great education. So it, it's, it's, you know, we really try to say, OK, what are those bigger problems? How can we tackle them with something that's not technology driven? Because we're not a VC fund, we're a real asset fund. And so therefore, we say, what are the products and services that you need some sort of physical asset to deliver? And that's what we kind of home in on. So you do need to look out quite a long way. And you need to try to see where you can tackle these problems. And then you need to look at what technology is doing that allows you to do that as well. And you need to kind of try to bring those together and bring some great teams together to ultimately deliver it. Um, and in order to sort of leverage innovation, it, it requires some pretty special attributes. Um, and we find ourselves in a situation where we have skills shortages. How do you attract the right ta talent? And this is a question for everybody, really. How do you attract the right talent into your organizations to ensure that you're fit for purpose for the future? Why don't I start and you guys go? <laughs> yeah. so, um, uh, for me, I think we find it great and easy to attract people because actually people buy into purpose now. Mm -hmm. I think in the past, people just kind of started a job and they clocked on and they clocked off 30 years later. 
I think people now really care about what they do and they want to see that impact. So I think broadly across all of our portfolio companies, they really buy into, call it the wider mission, and I talk about it within my team, that we're on a mission. You know, we're racing to try to find these next solutions. And I think that is ultimately what makes what we're doing quite interesting for people. But I'm interested in other views. Harry? Yeah, mm. sure, absolutely. I mean, I agree. Um, similar sort of line of work as Adam, but I, it, I mean, it's attracting people to work for Octopus and working in investing in this area is not too difficult. It's, it's what younger people want to get into. There's a, there's a purpose element there, um, and people want to do more with their jobs than just work in finance. I think actually the real challenge, um, it, it goes to the point around the just transition, is it's perhaps not the professional jobs and some of the industries we're backing and the, and the assets we're investing in. Um, it's making sure the opportunities are there for, for non-professionals to, to get the skills, get the opportunities, um, recognise as a real future, a massive future in all sorts of energy transition related assets, real assets, other businesses. Um, a huge amount of investment required and jobs will be created, but it's about providing the opportunities there globally for that. That's where the real effort's needed because um, that's where the uh, vast scale of people will, will be able to benefit from this and not feel left behind. Thanks. Any observations? Yeah, I, I guess I would relate to everything that has been said. Um, it, it's the com company culture that really can attract uh, talent and stick to the culture and, and explain how that works, but also allowing different people from different nationalities, different background to contribute to that, that transition. So I think that the transition is made of different, uh, different elements of the jigsaw and to allow that maybe even us when we hire people to be open to a different profile or a different skills that we haven't thought about before that could bring us to the transition in a different way. So definitely. I think that's a great point because actually none of this has been done before. You know, we were talking earlier about mm. this is still a little bit messy and it, you, know, you need yeah. people that have got different viewpoints because if you have just groupthink, you're never going to achieve something. And I think that's a really good point actually. Diversity of thought is such a big powerful need in what we're doing. And mixing industries. Like in, I'll talk to about ESG, environmental, <coughs> social and governance, but um, we are having people from the oil and gas industry because they have another point of view. Mm -hmm. So it, within my team, not necessarily mm -hmm. within the investment team, but it, it's it, interesting to see uh, mixing experiences, countries and, and background, how that can bring to new thinking and innovation. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add that it, living the purpose as well and actually embedding it through everything that you do as an organization um, is really important and we try to think now that we're making decisions through a, a climate lens um, and, and trying to really just frame everything we do from you know just basic decisions on the the organization and the buildings we choose to work in etc but all the way down to the companies we finance mm -hmm. um, and i also think training as well like this this whole area is new, um, as, as, as Peter says, it's, 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 it's changing, it's evolving. Um, so offering training and, and bringing people along as well on the journey, I think, is, is important. Ross, I'd like to bring us back to the much promised allocation uh, of capital sure. uh, following COP26. Um, can you give us some views on what you're seeing within uh, HSBC yeah. about the, uh, the the scale and speed at which capital is being deployed. Yeah, sure. So I, um, HSBC made a commitment in, in, in 2020 to advance between 750 uh, billion and a trillion dollars by by 2030, and um, we're making some pretty good uh, success in, in in that regard in allocating that capital. I think in the first year it was we did 44 billion, um, and that increased up to 127 at the end of last year, and we're now, as at H1, we were 171. So it's, it's building and the pace is increasing. So that's from our, from our own perspective. I think the sustainable finance market has exploded in, in, in volumes, and um, I think it hit 1.6 trillion in total last year. That's more than double um, where it was in, in 2019. And the pace of, of acceleration is, is really impressive. So I think the, I think capital is really moving towards sustainable activities and and and, and doing so at pace. Um, I think, you know, the proven technologies, the uh, solar, wind, um, and and those kind of technologies are attracting capital at incredibly 
cheap prices um, and really favorable terms. And there's no problem, I, I don't believe, in financing those kind of proven uh, projects and technologies. I think what's more challenging, and, and Peter mentioned it earlier, is you know, how do we finance these newer technologies that we need for the transition? We don't have 10 or 15 years to wait to have a, a nice operating track record and make sure the technology is proven. Um, and you know, it's great that there's equity investors that are investing into these new technologies, but I think to leverage that up, we need banks to you know, take a little bit more uh, risk on board, the right type of risk, um, and, and, and you know, be a little bit more progressive towards newer technologies. Um, also, just on, on, on the point on emerging markets, um, you know, I think it, it, it's true that you know, the, I think capital finds it easier to find a home in, in OECD Western countries. Um, but you know, those those emerging market uh, energy systems need need capital, and they need it you know quickly. Um, HSBC developed a partnership recently with uh, with Temasek called Pentagreen, um, which is a really interesting idea where we basically. Uh, looking to partner and mobilize a billion dollars towards marginal projects in Southeast Asia. So projects which are struggling to get senior bank debt financing, and we're trying to catalyze in other capital by sort of giving it that first nudge in the right direction mm -hmm. um, and bringing, bringing you know, the, the, this financing discipline that comes, comes with the institution. So um, I, think, I think capital is moving in the right direction, um, mm -hmm. uh, but, but capital needs to accelerate particularly towards those newer technologies mm -hmm. and also towards the emerging markets. I think you know, that there's, there's an awful lot of work to be done there. And then the point made earlier was great that we will pay the price if we don't you know, mm -hmm. provide that capital. So. And are you seeing lower costs of capital associated with green investment? Yeah, I think, I think, I think it's true. I, th I don't think the, it's not materially different, I would say. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there is a greenium, there is a, you know, there, there is a, a, a marginal, um, and I think statistically significant, you know, reduction in, in price for green instruments. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the loan market, it's often, it's harder to tell because, for example, with green loans, it, it tends to be, there's no explicit pricing reduction, um, but I think it, it, it features in additional competition and more banks want to be involved in the transaction if it's green, and you'll see more banks compete and more pressure on margins. Um, uh, and, and in the sustainability linked loan and bond market, you're, we're seeing explicit price reductions. Um, so where issuers meet their KPIs, they're getting a pricing benefit. So I think it, it, it's, it's cheaper. Um, and I think in terms of availability, you're going to see, you know, if banks are looking through a climate lens in their financing decisions, and uh, many banks, HSBC included, has a, has a commitment to align our financed emissions to net zero mm -hmm. by 2050, that banks are going to, you know, with their capital, they're going to allocate it towards those activities that help align to that pathway. Yeah. So, um, so in a similar way that Adam was talking about earlier around spotting the businesses that have effective transition strategies. Absolutely. Do you have an active program around how you monitor that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're, we're, I mean, we're, we've already set financed emission targets for a number of uh, key sectors. That was announced earlier this year for oil and gas and, and power and utilities, where we now have actual um, targets by 2025 uh, and targets by 2030 with specific um, reductions, and that's based on the pathway of the companies that we finance. And we're rolling that out to eight other sectors, so that should come, I think, within the next year. Um, and there's a huge body of work underway in the bank and in every bank, and the regulators are, are pushing this as well, that we need to understand our financed emissions pathway um, mm. and, and ultimately align so that what we're financing also aligns to the 1.5 degree agenda. So mm. it's, it's very difficult, it's very challenging, um, getting the right data, the availability of data, mm. the accuracy of the, of the data, um, you know, the bigger, bigger, you know, kind of Fortune 500 companies have the capacity and the uh, resources to, 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 to invest, to, to, to build the teams, to generate the, the data that's needed. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the smaller, even the sort of, even still large corporate businesses or mid-market businesses and, and SMEs, you know, just don't, don't have the data and are struggling. So I think that's a big area that needs to be addressed as well. And could you foresee a world in the not too distant future where if you don't have a transition strategy, 
uh, and a risk management mm -hmm. framework yeah. in line with that, that you're unbankable? Potentially, yes. I mean, I think most banks and our, our, our position is to work with our clients on the transition. So, um, you know, and uh, we're, we're not looking to exit, for example, mining and recognizing that you know, mining need, it has a very vital role to play in the energy transition. So it's more about talking to our customers, understanding their transition pathways and, you know, if they haven't got a plan, well, when are they going to have a plan? And I think I do think companies that just completely resist and say, you know, we're not buying into this, we're not going to bother investing, and we, we're not going to put together a plan. I think they will be unbankable. Yeah. Few mm. thought. <laughs> um, Harry, um, what do you see as the core components of an attractive energy transition business model? Well, I, mean, I work for Optus Energy. It's grown very quickly. It's done very well out of providing like a tech-enabled, green, sort of customer-friendly supply, electricity and gas supply, primarily in the UK um, and uh, overseas as well. We've got three million customers in the UK. I mean, so the business I work for has done very well out of being much better at customer service and providing green power um, than than everybody else, sort of disrupting the status quo, if you like. So that that's worked well for us. Um, in my sort of day to day role, I invest in, in companies that are delivering energy transition infrastructure. Sort of in that role, um, it's about having the right skill set to capitalize on the opportunity and probably some experience having done it before, your things, um, good business plan, um, focusing on sectors where there's ultimately a real kind of con consumer need, political support for, for driving those sectors forward. Um, I'll just take one example so, hydrogen. Um, just going back to some of the numbers mentioned earlier. Um, HSBC trying to get up to a trillion dollars. It's great. I mean, McKinsey published a report, I think it was earlier this year, where they said the energy transition needs $275 trillion of investment by 2050. Uh, that really kind of frames it for us. as a, um, It's a massive challenge. Everyone's got to do a lot. I think one 275th of that's a pretty good effort if you get there, actually. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's a vast amount of capital. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, we did some maths off the back of that. It's, it's growing the current energy transition industry 27 times in 28 years. And that's pretty daunting, but um, the solutions are there. And you can broadly split that down into half of that 275 trillion is renewable energy sources, and the rest are other sectors that go alongside to support that. Actually, the largest of which is hydrogen, which we worked out was um, about $80 trillion of that is probably going to be in the hydrogen sector. So big, big sector and quite a small one at the moment. Um, so, I mean, in that sector, it's about having a business model where you can scale rapidly and rolling out hydrogen, green hydrogen um, projects that, that can, you know, typically electrolyzers, you know, very established technology that's been around for, for many years and works, but rolling that out at a huge scale um, and making sure you're building big industrial projects that investors will, will want to invest in because they're well managed. So a lot of traditional industry skills being reapplied mm -hmm. there, and that's what we look for when we're backing businesses. And can you give an example of something that you're invested in? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, we are invested in a, a joint venture actually in hydrogen with a company called Res, who are, um, have got a renewable energy developer, uh, and they've done lots and lots of wind and solar projects. So, um, and we've built lots and lots of wind, wind and solar projects as an investor. We've got about 350 in the portfolio at the moment. So we're trying to put together our kind of combined skills. Mm -hmm. And then um, initially in the UK, go around building electrolyzer projects. So that's a, um, electrolyzers powered by green electricity, to turn water into hydrogen, supplying that to industrial customers. There's a, the UK government's behind it. There's a, there's a um, kind of government support scheme in place because the economics don't quite work yet. They probably will in the future. The UK government's um, coming in to say, well, we'll kind of help support the pricing on that to make it happen. Um, that's coming up in October. So that's real live sort of um, activity that's going on. And we're hoping that's going to grow internationally and be a big, big part of uh, you know, a growing international hydrogen industry. Um, that's one and lots of others, but I'll try not to waffle on too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, Julia, um, how are you seeing sustainability and ESG frameworks evolve to help businesses drive sustainability into their, their, their businesses in a time of transition? Yeah. Um, good. So 
uh, ESG, for, for who is less familiar with this word, is, uh, stands for environmental social and governance, um, and is a word used for the financial sector to explain how financial institutions consider those externalities that Adam was discussing before. So when, we think about, when I think about the transition and how ESG frameworks support that, I think the ESG has a, has a very fundamental role because it allows companies to see the different uh, aspects at a 360 degrees and holistically. And I think uh, the way ESG frameworks or ESG approaches are, has evolved, have evolved over time uh, um, can be seen really on, on three main aspects. One, the development by the regulator of taxonomy, so a common language that investors can really use to understand where am I investing. Second, maybe the, the, the support of an industry or, or a skills that is, is emerging, the ESG expert, so having an uh, retaining those talent or building an ESG team so that can understand what a specific company does and support the companies or the investment towards transition. And, and then the third very important point is learning to navigate the many frameworks, the many sustainability frameworks that we have on climate, on biodiversity, on reporting. So it's really between the mandatory and the voluntary uh, initiatives is really, can be really overwhelming. How do you make that material to your own business? So when it comes to taxonomy, I don't know how, ma how many people are familiar with the EU taxonomy, which is part of the EU Sustainable uh, Finance Action Plan. That's really a framework that tells you what are the activities that, if I invest in that activities, I will be considered as a transitioning. And there are three types of, of activities. So renewable is a green, is a green activity. If you invest in, 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 in solar, that will be considered green. But that's not enough. So that's one point. Then you have to explain how you are looking at other risk, environmental and social risk, ensuring that you're not doing uh, significant harm. So that's the second kind of check that you have to, to ensure within your uh, process, risk management process. And then going beyond climate, because th there has been a, a, foc like a, a real attention on climate, but sustainability is broader, is, is water, is biodiversity, is people, particularly that. So it's considering these different things. And then an investor would know whether from a 0% to 100% you are aligned to the taxonomy. And that helps, helps building the, the portfolio and the capital allocation towards transition. Uh, the second point that I mentioned is building that skills. Um, I'm an environmental engineer, so I do not come from a financial background. And I build my financial background over time uh, at JP Morgan at an, a, credit, a credit export, um, sorry, export credit uh, agency before, and now in an in a investment fund. But the, the skills that an ESG expert needs to have are really many and different. And as a, as a senior manager now, when I, when I hire people, I look for a social expert, um, a carbon expert, a legal, per, a legal um, expert. So it could be really a combination of, of, of different skills. And it's something that we need to develop to attract uh, talent and to attract people that could be in the investment, uh, investment career, but they want to develop that with a purpose, to go back to what we said. Um, and the third point that really makes a company an investment transition is navigating through the really many initiatives. Uh, some were mentioned by Adam uh, in, the, in the keynote, but it really, how do you make those material? I think when I, even for me as an expert, I struggle to keep up with all of them. Um, I group them in two main buckets. One is the mandatory compliance driven, uh, and then the voluntary one. And I've always been working on the voluntary before the EU came up with the um, EU SFDR. The EU SFDR is the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's really heavy on, on requirements for companies. And it's, it's right, it, it's good to have a, a backup from the regulator to force companies to report. You, you have to comply and you have to explain how you align with the taxonomy. But it can be burdened sometimes mm -hmm. to kind of shift away from your strategy and your voluntary initiatives that you want to be involved in or you, you have to be involved in. 
the key key one for the <coughs> energy sector that are, I think have, can, can be important to consider are definitely the task force on climate related financial disclosures, so the TCFD, which was really powerful. Why? Because it combined uh, investors, uh, policymaker, stakeholders, NGOs, and 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 technical te te technocrat, if you want, towards one objective of climate. Same for the uh, TNFD, so it's the same as TCFD, but with nature-related uh, uh, financial disclosures. So how do we address within our business uh, natural capital conversation? How do we make that as a as an opportunity, and what do we need to disclose to allow investors to understand what that they what are they investing in? Um, there's definitely the ISSB as well, is the uh, International Standard uh, and Sustainability Board, which is coming up with standards and data that are um, standardized for the in, uh, financial sector. Um, and then we have the uh, science-based uh, target initiative, the SBTI, and, and the very important initiative that Adam mentioned, the TPI, the Transition Pathways Initiative, which I, I thought I wasn't as aware as, as, I, um, as I was listening to, to Adam. It's a very important initiative because it forces you or invites you to think what is the strategy for a company to transition. And, and for me, mm. that's critical for Next Energy. It's not enough to be in the solar sector and to have a good, solid, ESG, robust uh, due diligence process. But we need to think about our strategy and our suppliers. On the market we operate, if we want to transition completely, we need to think about our suppliers. Where does the, the modules, the raw material that Adam was referring to, where do they come from? And at what cost uh, socially and uh, economically and, and, and environmentally? So the TPI is a, is a really mm -hmm. important initiative that helps uh, defining those ESG mm -hmm. strategies. Now, a lot of these frameworks, Julia, are requiring us, I mean, that they're forcing disclosure but really good disclosure and good quality disclosure requires us to have access to good data. <laughs> Can you say something about the data challenge? And I'm sure everybody's got a view on this because it, it, it's one of the key challenges at the moment, isn't it? How do we get hold of really good quality data? Yeah, this is definitely it's the elephant in the room. I guess data getting, well, f first is the standardization of data. So the, what do we need for climate data? What do we need for water data or biodiversity data? So the first thing is just coming up. All these initiatives are, are working, particularly the IS, ISSB, um, the Sustainable Standard Board initiative is working to, to provide a, a standardization of data. Um, the second challenge is who do we ask the data? And so we need to map. So where do we have an impact? How do we? Who do we ask the data to? Our suppliers to our own company. So making sure that we are asking the right question when we ask mm -hmm. for data, and then just finding. I think the key challenge is scope three. I don't know. It was mentioned scope one, two, and three. Scope one: greenhouse gas emission are the emissions of our own company. So just having an office or uh, it, it's our own direct. Scope two emission is those of our employees, for example, that travels. And then scope three, which is the big, big challenge of data quality and data gathering, is the, the emission of our suppliers. And the challenge is that companies need to force themselves to think about the materiality mapping. Who are the suppliers that are contributing massively to our or, or more materially, substantially to our supply chain, to our uh, CO2 emission. And then there's the human rights data that is not by definition a data. So I mentioned these when you look at ES and G, the S data are very challenging to be quantified. And you need to find the way you, meaning a company needs to find a way of, of um, making it simple for investors to to read. Sometimes they are quali uh, qualitative data, but you just have to find a way of reporting mm -hmm. uh, the unquantifiable. Thank you, sir. So the, the, the whole sort of data landscape is changing <coughs> dramatically. Is there's consolidation? You've got Europe <coughs> and other governments intervening and determining quite 
in inordinate detail some of the disclosure requirements. You've got voluntary initiatives where you sort of codify it on behalf of significant constituencies of investors, etc. So I, I think you'll see a consolidation rapidly over the next couple of years, quite clearly. There is enough data to make decisions now. You should not be prevented from making decisions and balancing those decisions in the context of your priorities with the information you've got now. And yes, of course, we need a lot more information, etc. but do not allow that to stop taking action because mm -hmm. there isn't the time quite frankly, and there does need to be a greater element of understanding some of the risks in the context of the point that Peter's making. But I, I think that you'll see a, a much clearer sort of determination, both be it from regulators or be it from ultimately the, the investment community or banks saying, right, this mm -hmm. is what we require, that's it, yeah. get with it. These are transition plan criteria. I mean, I sit on the UK Treasury Task Force on the transition plans. Um, that will codify. Hopefully, that will be very complementary to what Europe's doing and where the US and Japan are going so that we don't have lots of different kind of transition plan criteria. But mm. these things are going to sort of work themselves through relatively soon. Um, mm. But transparency is going to be there and accountability based on that transparency is going to be there in a way that it hasn't been. Um, and I think that will be a really important part of driving the transition in these areas. But it's also going to come on governments as well transparency around their own sovereign bonds, what are they raising, mm -hmm. how their, um, their own transition plans are coming along. And you talk about pace and scale, Peter. I mean, you're at that innovative end of the market. How do we, how do we accelerate to net zero? I mean, it feels like at, at this point in time, geopolitical backdrop, macroeconomic environment, that mm. uh, there are numerous challenges, and it feels like we're in a sort of veering towards a disorderly uh, transition, and I don't know if that's fair, but it feels like that. Um, so how do we move at scale? It's the trillion dollar question, I guess. Mm. Um, look, I think the way that we look at it is that we've got to show that the stuff that we're doing works. And ultimately, I was in renewables 15 years ago when the first deals that we did were at 15% unlevered IRRs. You know, you're doing them now at 3 or 4% unlevered IRRs because you've got huge track record and you can prove that it works. And I think Ultimately, the best thing that we can do as a group and a forum of people is to show that our new innovative things work. Then that brings in more capital to the next phase where you can perhaps get a bank along to say, OK, I've got a couple of years of track record. That then mobilises more capital. Then that brings in the more, I guess, the, the mature pools of capital that just want to do stuff that's quite proven. And then that's really when you get the mushroom in, in capital. So I think all I think about now is just getting this stuff to work and, and keep trying to find where we can go next as well that will allow us to continue to mobilise capital into some of these, these big problems. Yeah, yeah I think um, just to add to that, if you're going to wait for like, the policy landscape to be clean and the markets mm -hmm. to be really clear, it's not going to happen. You don't need to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's been proven if you if you be prepared to go into some of these sectors earlier, you look at exactly... It's, Peter said, like, wind and solar 15 years ago, um, you'll have made good returns if you went relatively early, and I think investors really recognise that in some of these newer <coughs> sectors. Um, yeah, it's going to be disorderly because it's got to happen so fast, but um, that doesn't mean you should slow down and stop, stop mm. pushing ahead um, because I think the pace at which these sectors mature and investors get comfortable is, is rapidly accelerating because of the opportunity. Mm. So people want to get in it so, as soon as they can. You, you've got to kind of get them comfortable, but it's um, the demand and the capital certainly there. And the demand is coming from the capital. Yeah, All definitely. of our LPs are saying, I want you to tell yeah. us exactly yeah. what you're doing. What is the impact? Yeah, we talked about it earlier. I could, there is a growing pool of investors that care and that recognise actually that you probably will get outsized returns by going in relatively earlier yeah. into some of these fields when they do well. So I think it is coming. And I think we just need more conscious investors that recognise that it's not diminution of their fiduciary duties to generate returns and I think that's then going to be the next stage because I guess the limited partners that we know about in the universe they are generally quite risk averse naturally like they should be taking the third or fourth investment into these types of things so it's just a learning curve I think our job also is to tell them about what's going on tell them about the impact and that it works and it's just going to take a bit of time um, so I think our job is to be educators out there and to show that this is working and it's really impactful. Yeah, great point. Um, Adam, the transition's here, it's here to stay. H last question to you, how do we, how do we ensure it's a just transition? Well, I, I mean, if you look at the UK, you have the experience of what happens when you leave a community behind in the coal mining communities, which you still have the legacy of um, being lived out by some parts of our community. So we're, we're acutely conscious of, of what happens when you get it wrong. So 
it is absolutely imperative that when you look at the transition, you've got to look at the impacts on those that are going to need to be taken along with it. Otherwise, they'll oppose it, and, and rightly so, because they're, their direct financial interests, their livelihoods are under threat. And so, therefore, how do you find the ways in which this can be a transition that really works in everyone's interests? I think the term of just transition, though, we need to be careful that we don't too narrowly define it purely around workers in industries that have to transition. It's a, there's just transitions in many ways. Justice is a word that has application to intergenerational aspects, justice between the poor and the wealthiest, um, those in low-lying states. So, so I think we need a broader engagement with the just transition beyond workforces. But the workforce does need to be brought along, and, and we're doing a lot of work at the moment with, with churches, with unions, with um, companies in South Africa around how do you have a vision of a reformed mining sector, not just on climate, but on issues like automation, but climate as well, that enables fundamentally an enormous change in that whole sector and that communities come along with that and share in the benefit of that, um, whilst also recognising that there's going to be job losses in that. And so how do you manage that without actual civil strife, which is the other path that there could be? Mm -hmm. And it's not to, and we shouldn't pretend that there, that isn't necessarily going to happen in some places, it is. Um, but we really, it's incumbent on us as investors to be ensuring that we're working with governments, but also with the underlying companies to ensure that these things are factored in. Um, and a lot more work needs to be done in that area than there currently is on that. I think there's been a, um, yeah, uh, I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you. And on that note, can I thank all the panel for your contribution today? It's really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panellists there for that discussion. Um, there's so much to take away from that session, I think particularly looking for purpose, impact and value creation in a disorderly transition. It's now time for us to have our first coffee break of the afternoon. Our coffee sponsor today is KPMG. On your table, you'll find a sustainable and reusable coffee cup. This is a gift for you to take away today and to use during the coffee break. So please enjoy the refreshments, discuss the topics raised this afternoon, and we look forward to picking up with you again in half an hour's time. <laughs>